Hello, everybody. So I am so, so pleased to be here because um, 20 years ago, you actually changed my self-concept. Because um, I read your book, The Botany of Desire, and before that, I kind of thought of myself as like a human who is, you know, like striving and struggling in the world. And then after I read that, I was just like, oh, I'm just like a tool of the potato. Like, that's <laughs> what I am doing. And it, it like just blew my mind. If you haven't read it, you should, totally should. So, you decided to write a book about drugs. So, why don't you just start? <laughs> Yeah. Well, first, Elise, it's great to be doing this with you because well, you. I'm a, a tremendous fan of your work. So you. I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased that you agreed to do this. Um, yeah, it was a bit of a departure, I guess. Yeah. I mean, drugs. We do take these things into our bodies, mm -hmm. like food, and uh, mushrooms can serve in both capacities. That's true. Um, so there is some uh, precedent that way, but. Well, just why don't you just start by just explaining the class of drugs that you got interested in? Psychedelics. Right. So, but I, I've been interested in other kinds of drugs. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, it's, you know, my, my food work is kind of what most people know, but going back to Botany of Desire, there's a long chapter in there about cannabis. And my, my largest interest is our, uh, the food work is an outgrowth of a larger interest in our relationship to other other species uh, and how they change us and how we change them and, ha and, and how a certain class of plants gr evolved to gratify our desires. Mm -hmm. And so you can understand something about us by looking at those plants. And we know, you know, we use plants obviously to feed ourselves, mm -hmm. for beauty, for, to, to clothe ourselves. I mean, we have all these uses that are pretty obvious. But then there's this really interesting weird one, which is we use plants to change the contents of our, or the, our experience of consciousness. Almost everybody in this room, I'll bet, today used a plant in this way. Nah. <laughs> well, maybe. Coffee, well. tea, <laughs> you know, a cigarette. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's very common. Yeah. And, it, and it's a curious human desire. Why aren't we happy with the consciousness we have? Well, that, that brings me to, like, I have to say, I, I read the book, and, I, and it starts with this pro, prologue that I think you call A New Door. And the book felt personal to me, like there was a personal quest to it that I didn't necessarily feel in the same way. Um, it, it felt like in the prologue you kind of talk about yearning to open this new door. And I was wondering if you could talk for a second about, you know, what was it in... What, where were you in your life? Yeah. Like, what drove this interest? Yeah. So, any book you do, if you're going to put in the work that it takes to write a book and spend years and think so hard about something and read so intensively, at some level it's going to be driven by some deep desire or need. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but you don't always know what it is. You just think mm -hmm. you're curious. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, journalism starts with curiosity. That's what we are. We're mm -hmm. curious people. Um, but as I got it, and I started out becoming curious because I'd read about these trials. These, they, were, they, were, you know, they had this crazy idea. They were giving psilocybin to people who were dying of cancer. It sounds really nutty to me. Not, mm -hmm. the, not what I would want to do if I had gotten a terminal diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But it was helping people. Uh, and it was changing their outlook on their mortality mm -hmm. completely. Mm -hmm. A single experience. Um, and so I was very curious to understand that. But something else was going on in my life. And, and I didn't realize that till actually just a couple weeks ago. Um, a friend of mine read the book and said, God, I was really struck by the fact your father is on every page. And it took me a while because... Uh, and my father died in January. And... Um, and the whole period I was working on this was he had had this terminal diagnosis. He had lung cancer. And um, he didn't want to talk about his mortality. He didn't want to talk about his cancer. He was one of these people who, and it was generational perhaps, he was in his late 80s, but he processed it to the extent he did internally and didn't really share mm -hmm. it with us. But I needed to process it. And, um, and here I was, I had this wonderful but very sad opportunity to talk to people struggling with, you know, right up against it, their, mm -hmm. their mortality. And they had had an experience that allowed them to talk about it very openly and very frankly. And, um, 
And so I was, so part of it was the, that I needed to have that conversation and it was going on with these, you know, drug trials. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was definitely part of it. In my own life, um, as I talked to these people, and, and I started off doing a very kind of straight piece of science journalism mm -hmm. that was published in The New Yorker in 2015. It's called The Trip Treatment, and you can get it online or on my website, um, looking at these trials for people who are dying. My conversations with these people made me so curious, and I hadn't really had a psychedelic experience, I realized, and the fact that they were able to change so mm -hmm. late in life, mm -hmm. I mean, most of these people are in their 50s and 60s and mm -hmm. 70s, um, you know, that, was, that became attractive too. I mean, I think we're all stuck in one way mm -hmm. or another. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of us are seriously stuck and we're depressed or addicted or obsessive or anxious, and, but the rest of us are mildly stuck. Right. <laughs> and, and sometimes more than that, and that we all have habits of thought and behavior that we'd like to change. And here were people who acquired all at once, and I'll tell you how a little later, this new perspective on the scene of their own lives that actually allowed them to change. And that became, I realized I, I wanted... You were yearning I, for that in some way? I was, I was. I didn't, I didn't really think anything was broken in my life, but as I heard these stories, it, it became... You wondered who you could be? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, so that became a driving personal. So what had begun as journalistic curiosity became a much more pressing uh, quest. And obviously that meant not just reporting on this, but participating in the story. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a fateful step too. Mm -hmm. Did you know going in that you were going to try? You know, when I wrote the New Yorker piece, I didn't, it didn't even occur to me. But by the end of it, when I decided to do a book, it was like, how can I write this book and, and really... Not and not have the experience I'm describing. <laughs> How can I write no, I, a book and not have the experience? Well, it's also, sure. it's also kind of my brand, yeah. you know. I, when I wanted to write about the cattle industry, I, I, I bought a steer and... Yeah. <laughs> so this is it what... seemed I, inevitable. Yeah, this is what people expect from me. <laughs> so I did it for you. <laughs> That's right, he sacrificed for you. Um, so why don't we just go back, and, and why don't you tell us, I loved this idea, I honestly, like, I loved the idea of the world's very first LSD trip. Yeah. Like, I was like, oh yeah, as soon as, you, as soon as I read that, I was like, oh yeah, there was the first one. So why don't you tell us about that, and when and where it was, and, sure. and um, because part of what was so, like, interesting about it was this was the first LSD trip innocent of experience, I think yes. it's the phrase. No expectations. Right. No, because, uh, or in, yes. Because we know that set and setting, um, and these are terms that actually Timothy Leary popular, popularized in the 60s, but set and setting has a lot to do with the experience. The experience is not foreordained in the drug. Um, the right. drugs are kind of, uh, Stan Groff, who's one of the pioneers of this, uh, of LSD psychiatry in the 60s, said that they're unspecific amplifiers of mental e experience. And um, so what you're looking for has a big bearing on what you get. Um, not, it's not always what you want, but uh, uh, so um, it's interesting to go back to the origin, the, the first time when someone had this experience and, and they weren't programmed in right. any way. Because frankly, all of us who have done psychedelics or will do psychedelics have been influenced right, by what we... Right, that's what I was thinking. I was like, they, uh, that's what I was Aldous thinking. Aldous Huxley, uh, the doors of perception, I think, probably influenced everybody. And there's some curious things about psychedelic experience, like they have a very Eastern flavor. Uh -huh. And I've always wondered, is that intrinsic to the drug or is it because Aldous Huxley had a very Eastern concept of religion? Right. You know, could there be a more Christian tradition of psychedelic use? That's or, a good or, question. <laughs> or more Jewish. Right. Right? So right. We got to get that into Judaism. There are more books to that's be written. That's what Judaism needs. Um, so anyway, so that's why Albert Hoffman's trip is, is, I think, important. So Albert Hoffman was a young chemist, and he worked for Sandoz, uh, which is now Novartis, I mean, a big pharmaceutical company in Switzerland. And he was working uh, on drug development, uh, and as often happens, he started with a, a plant drug, um, actually a fungus drug, uh, ergot, which is a um, fungus that infects grain, rye, and, and sometimes wheat. And it's been associated, actually, with out, outbreaks of delirium throughout uh, Western history. And, and some people think the Salem witch trials uh, 
which happened after a wet year where the grain was all infected, mm. that the behavior of the women who were thought to be witches may have been affected by the fact that ergot, which can make you uh, hallucinate, and I mean, it's, uh, so it may have been involved in that. So anyway, they were doing derivatives, uh, synthesizing the different compounds in ergot and seeing if they might be useful in some medical way. I think it had something to do with uh, staunching bleeding in childbirth or something like that. Um, I'm not sure. And uh, he, he, he was working through them, and he, and he got to the 25th derivative, uh, LSD-25, uh, lysergic acid diethylamide. And, Oof, um, that is really impressive that you can say all these <laughs> words together. It's right, the only, only chemical I can do that with, <laughs> except maybe carbon. Um, and, um, he, uh, uh, and he tested, they tested on animals and it didn't have the desired effect. He puts it on the shelf. And this is the story he tells. It's, the more I hear it, the more fishy it seems. But uh -huh. anyway... Um, Five years later, in 1943, in the middle of the war, he has a presentiment that this is a valuable chemical, and he resynthesizes it and takes it off the shelf, which is not commonly done, and partly because he thought it was such a beautiful molecule. And when he's doing it, he accidentally ingests some. The thing about LSD, one of the things about LSD, is that it is active in infinitesimal doses. It is measured, doses are measured in micrograms, okay, which is a millionth of a gram. Uh, most of the drugs you take are measured in milligrams. Um, uh, so he gets some on his finger or on his lip or something like that, and he starts having these uh, hallucinations and, and feeling really funny, and he realized this is a psychoactive compound. So then he does what lots of scientists did at the time, which is test it on themselves. It was a very common practice. So he took something like 250 micrograms, um, and, uh, and has, a, has a big experience. And it's very disturbing at first. Um, and he felt he was, uh, that his, his self had left his body and they had separated and one was on the ceiling and he was looking down at himself and he realizes, I gotta get out of the lab, which is where he is. And, um, but there's, it's wartime, there's no gasoline. He hops on his bicycle <laughs> and has this, now famous bicycle ride, you know, tottering home <laughs> while he's tripping. His, his lab assistant, you know, accompanied him. Um, and this bicycle ride is now commemorated every, I think, April 19th. Is that right? Somebody, yeah. It's like, a, you know, it's going to be a national holiday someday. Um, <laughs> and, um, and he comes home and he lies down and he calls the doctor. Or he has his assistant call the doctor. And the doctor looked at him and said, you know, your eyes are a little dilated, but blood pressure's fine, all your vitals are fine, there's nothing wrong with you. And yet he is, you know, tripping. And, um, uh, and the experience gradually morphs and, and becomes a very positive thing. And he describes this scene of being in his garden toward the end of the trip. And, um, and he felt like this was, um, he was seeing nature for the first time. He was Adam in nature. And he has this incredibly beautiful description of, uh, you know, the garden with dew on it and, and just this transcendent beauty. Uh -huh. and, um, so if this was a trip, innocent of experience, maybe that is... There's maybe we, genuine innocence. Yeah. yeah. I mean, first sight, uh, wonder. I mean, that, and that is a, definitely a quality of psychedelics that you... Uh, and some other drugs is that your memory of things uh, gives way to... Uh, which, which tends to program our experience. You know, most of, our, most of the things we perceive, we don't actually perceive. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the brain is... I know is, about that. You yes. know, yeah. It's a predictive machine, right? Mm -hmm. so, so when you see a tree, uh, there's a certain... You, t you glance at a tree and there's a little pattern of green blotches and it's kind of fractal. And you don't really see a tree. You then go to a prediction of tree, right? right? And, and your image is a prior... That's um, interesting. And so our experience is actually imagined. I mean, a lot of our yeah, experience yeah. is imagined. It's corrected uh -huh. um, when we go off. But psychedelic seems to disable that handshake between the prior, your expectation of what you're going to see, and what you're actually seeing. So then you really see. So you really, sometimes oh, you so really do see freshly. You see with that sense of first sight, which is, can be very powerful and, and overwhelming. Oh, but really it doesn't always work that way because sometimes the priors actually get overactive and oh. try to explain everything, and that's when you see faces in the clouds. Okay. All right. So, so this nice man, he <laughs> doses himself, um, and um, 
he sets off, and you say, you, I think you had the, you said this the, this kind of experience in 1943. It unlocks brain science. What do you what do you well, mean? Like what it like, helps what, eventually. So here he, he realizes he's he's found this amazing compound, but. What is it good for? What do you do with yeah. it? You know, Sandoz doesn't sell recreational drugs. I mean, um, and, and, and so he's, he's, he, he decides, the, the company decides to find out what it's researcher and let them fool around with it and try it and let's see what they come up with. Uh -huh. they, they sort of crowdsource this 10-year or 15-year R&D <laughs> thing. Uh -huh. And if you had good stationery, you could get LSD-25 from Sandoz, you know? <laughs> you could be a therapist, you could be uh -huh. a scientist. Any, you know, any of us could probably have gotten it with the right stationery. Um, and it opens up, though, a, a field in a way because we didn't have an understanding of neurochemistry at the time. And the mm -hmm. fact that something in such small quantities could have such a profound effect on the mind was a, was a strong bit of evidence that there is a neurochemical system and that there are certain chemicals that um, uh, mediate our experience and our mood. And, um, and so you can draw a line from this discovery to, you know, the discovery of serotonin and the serotonin receptors and, and this mm -hmm. whole blossoming of neuroscience, of neurochemistry that happens in the, in the 50s. Um, that LSD inspired it in many ways. Okay, so so I, I, if you can just kind of take us through. So what did he, what did they want, or what did they believe that this drug would accomplish in the early days? Yeah. And then what was the path that it 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 took? Well, this is a very interesting period in the fifties when people are experimenting. And they go through a set of different models of what this is. The first is the, and, and it's reflected in the changing name of what do you call these drugs, because they weren't called psychedelics at first. At first they were called psychotomimetics, uh, drugs that essentially mimicked um, psychosis, because that's what it looked like. Somebody on a LSD trip, you know, is having their, their personality is falling apart and they're having delusions and uh, paranoid fantasies, all sorts of things, and so, well, that must be psychosis. And they thought, well, maybe this is a good drug to help us understand schizophrenia. And we can, it suggests that maybe schizophrenia has a chemical basis, but also maybe for the therapist, this would be useful because we could have an experience and understand what it feels like to be mad. Mm -hmm. And many of them approached it this way and they took the drug and then they said, yeah, it's actually much more pleasurable than that. <laughs> um, <laughs> It doesn't seem like madness. I mean, sometimes it seems like madness, but it doesn't seem like madness. And then they tried another model, um, the psycholytic model, um, and that just means mind loosening. And there was this whole wave of um, psychiatrists, both in, in London and in L.A. especially, that were including it in their psychotherapy sessions because they found in small doses, I don't know exactly what the dose was, but it was under 100 uh, micrograms, you know, 65, 70, uh, that if you gave it to someone before their session, they would get over their, their defenses would be somewhat lowered and they could surface lots of repressed material and be very comfortable talking about it. And a whole lot of people we've heard of had this kind of therapy, including notably um, Jack Nicholson, um, hmm. Cary Grant, um, Cary Grant had 60 um, trips with his psychiatrist, Oscar Janiger. And, um, but, you know, and, and he emerged, he said, a, um, uh, a reborn, that he had been reborn. And he said, I lost my ego, which he thought was a great thing for mm -hmm. acting. Mm -hmm. And he said, and I became irresistible to women. Mm -hmm. Which, that which, was, which that's sounds kind trip? of egotistical. All you need is 60 <laughs> trips. <laughs> Um, anyway, yeah. and he gave a very famous interview about uh -huh. this to yeah. a gossip columnist, Joseph Hyams, in 1959. And that's how a lot of people first heard about psychedelics. And Andre Preva, and there's a whole list yeah. of people. Um, and, and it was useful that way. It appeared to be. The, the psychiatrist thought it was. Um, this, this isn't drug trials. This mm -hmm. is anecdotal mm -hmm. reports. But then this really interesting research group... Um, uh, that is in Canada, in Saskatchewan, uh, that consists of an English psychiatrist uh, named Humphrey Osmond, who gave the name psychedelic to psychedelics, uh, and his colleague Abram Hoffer, and this really mysterious, interesting character named Al Hubbard, mm -hmm. who's not a professional... Do you know him? Are you related? 
<laughs> um, who's, he's not a professional in any way. He's kind of this uh, man of mystery who is, uh, he was a rum runner during um, Prohibition. He ran arms to England when it was illegal, probably for the OSS. He was an OSS agent. He was an agent of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms at the same time he was a smuggler. So he's clearly a double agent. He was an inventor. He was involved. He was the science director of a uranium company that supposedly supplied the Manhattan Project. He had his hand in everything interesting mm-hmm. for a very long time. And, and became very wealthy. Um, he had a, also a fleet of ships that he captained, and he was called Captain Trips. And um, <laughs> Jerry Garcia is not Captain Trips, it's uh, Al Hubbard. Uh, anyway, he, I'm going to just tell a little story yeah, about him. All right, okay. yeah, please. So he turns 50. He was born in 1901, 1902. Uh, he turns 50 and is having a midlife crisis. He's miserably unhappy, he doesn't know what to do with his life. Uh, this is uh, 1950. Um, he, uh, he takes a hike in Washington State, and he has what he calls an angelic visitation. Some angel visits him in a clearing and says, he's, he's a devout Catholic, by the way, it's important to know that, um, says that you, um, you are about to learn something that will be very important to the future of humankind, and you can choose whether to be involved or not. And he has no idea what this is. And then a year later, he reads an article in a scientific journal about early studies with LSD and rats, I think it was. And he realizes maybe this is it. And he um, reaches out to the researcher. He gets some LSD. Sandoz is giving it mm-hmm. to everybody. And uh, takes it and has this uh, transformative experience where he uh, becomes a little mite in a swamp and he observes the birth of life and the intercourse of his parents and has this big mystical experience. And he realizes this is it. This is what's going to change the future of humankind. And he decides to get involved. Because of his connections, OSS or whatever, he goes to Sandoz and they give him a, an amount of LSD that is unimaginable. I mean, and no one knows exactly how much. I've read three different accounts. In one, it's a liter bottle, okay? Which is enough LSD to probably to turn on a third of the population of the earth at that time. <laughs> Because I told you how powerful it is. And um, in another account, it's 6,000 vials. And he oh. keeps them hidden, buried in a, near his house in Death Valley. And he has a satchel full of LSD. And he goes around. And his plan is this. He's going to turn on the best and the brightest. He's an elitist. He's uh-huh. a very conservative man. Uh-huh. He's going to turn on the... He cap- doesn't sound that conservative. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> well, I'll com- just go with that. Compared to, to his politics are very conservative. Um, he's going to uh, turn on captains of industry, uh, uh, engineers, architects, mm-hmm. people in the church, the Catholic church. Mm-hmm. And he goes around and, and, and arranges to do this for people. Remember, it's all legal at this point. Right. And the idea is that whatever is learned about the true nature of reality or the universe will filter down to the population. Hmm. Anyway, it turns out he, has so many, he, he turns on like 6,000 people, apparently. Wow. And he becomes a very gifted guide. And, um, and that's a very important part of the story then, but also now. Yeah, and I, and I, and I want to get to that. But I'm curious because, you know, there was this big turn where, um, it, you know, um, these drugs in, in the 60s, they, they, yeah. they, they, you know... Escaped the laboratory is the They meme. escaped yeah. the laboratory. Was, so, and, and, and then got blackballed in, in a certain yeah. way. And, um, and I'm just kind of wondering, like, I'm wondering, it, it, did it have to go that way? Was he, was he part, like, if it, had, if it hadn't been for Hubbard him, Hubbard was he, into keeping it closed, even though he was not in the laboratory. If he turned on 6,000 people, he should have thought about that. <laughs> because that's not how to keep it closed. He was turning on the right people. Oh, he was turning um, on the right people. Now, um, he actually hated what Timothy Leary was doing and, and threatened to shoot him at one point. Oh, the other thing to know about Al Hubbard is he carried a gun at all times and he wore a paramilitary uniform. Now, you wouldn't think that a really sensitive psychedelic guide would be dressed that way. I don't, I don't know what that was about. Okay. So, all right. So, so... But, but, it, is, but it is Hubbard who, who realizes how important set and setting is, even though he doesn't okay. use those terms. And he is the one who says, no, you can't do this in a hospital room. They were, they were dosing people in, like, white rooms with uh-huh. fluorescent lights and then leaving them alone. He said, no, you've got to stay with them. You need really nice music, flowers. Mm-hmm. 
put on a blindfold, and he essentially designed the modern protocol for how to administer um, psychedelics in a clinical setting. No one wants to claim him as an intellectual ancestor for the, the reasons I've just given, mm -hmm. but, but, he, but he is, he, he, he deserves credit for a lot of what's happening now. So what deserves credit for what happened to psych? I mean, I, I, the thing that I found myself wondering as I was kind of reading it is like, was the was what happened to psychedelics in the sixties inevitable? Yeah, it's a really because good if question. it was inevitable, then will it happen again? There's there's been like the the kind of broad thing is, you know, psychedelics were born by this nice man and his bicycle ride, and they start off on this kind of very scientific, scientific path, trajectory. Yeah. They get co-opted by the culture. They get seen as a profound threat, and they get shut down and shut out of science. And I'm wondering, you know, are there, are there people, like, is, was that, is that the inevitable path? Yeah. Is that path inevitable? So will it be repeated? Or is it that there were a handful of characters who, had they not gotten involved, yeah. right. like, the, the history of, like, we would all have a very different kind of sense of what these drugs were, and they would have a different cultural meaning. Yeah. So, it's a really interesting question, and obviously we don't know. Um, I don't think anything is inevitable in history. I, you know, I think that... Um, uh, but I do think the tendency is to blame Timothy Leary. I mean, Timothy Leary is conducting research mm -hmm. at Harvard in the early 60s, and all the researchers I talked to, I would say, so what, ha what happened? What killed the research? And they said, it's, it's, they would always say the same thing. It's too simple to blame Timothy Leary, but then they would proceed to blame, to blame Timothy, Timothy Leary <laughs> um, with that proviso. So uh, Leary did lose patience with science, and, 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 and this happens to people who study this stuff. They get so enthusiastic that they lose patience and they think, you know what, everybody needs to take these right now to fix our problems. I mean, that's a very common thing. And I see some researchers today who they, they know better than to say that, but they feel that. Um, they, they really feel that our species needs this, which is stunning to hear from very sober scientists. Um, but anyway, so if Leary hadn't done it, and let's say Leary never got involved with psychedelics or kept it at Harvard and there was a, you know, and he, and he followed the rules and didn't give it to undergraduates, um, which is what happened. He didn't, but his partner, uh, Richard Alpert, now Ram Dass, gave it to undergraduates. Their, their rule at Harvard was they could give it to graduate students, but not to undergraduates. And, um, <laughs> but that broke down. Um, <laughs> And actually, you know who, bo who broke that story is Andrew Weil, Dr. Andrew Weil, yeah. who was at the Crimson then mm. and was really pissed off that Leary wouldn't give him any psychedelics. <laughs> and <laughs> journalists have mixed motives sometimes. Um, so where was I? So, well, yeah. oh, so, well, I but, okay, so Ken is, Kesey, though, yeah. is turned on on the West Coast. Ken Kesey, the novelist, um, participates in an experiment organized by the CIA the CIA turns on Ken Kesey. Ken Kesey realizes this is amazing, and he starts trying to dose everybody he can. You know, he sets up uh -huh. the acid tests in, in the West Coast. And that's 61, 62 also. So it could have entered the culture that way. Uh -huh. And it's, it's kind of amazing to think that the, the 60s might have been a CIA mind control experiment <laughs> gone, gone really bad or good, depending on your perspective. That's funny. But, I mean, yeah, I, I mean... I, I found that because you write in your book that like every culture that ha has tried to kind of um, shutter these drugs, um, and so that made me think: Is there something inherent in the well, drug yeah. that's dangerous or or that's threatening? And so, will that be the inevitable result? Yeah, of because it happened once. Because it was threatening then doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be threatening now, and I'll explain why. Um, I mean, many cultures have been threatened by psychedelic drugs. Think about when the Spanish get to Mexico, they, they conquer Mexico, and there are these mushroom cults. And they're, they're, the Indians there are using mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms, as their sacrament, and they call it teonantacatl, which means flesh of the gods. Gee, just like the Catholic sacrament, right? I mean, you've got the, the blood and the uh, body of Christ. But the problem is the Indian sacrament is so much better because you, 
No, you actually, you don't need faith. You actually see God, you know, and the Spanish couldn't allow that to happen. That was a huge threat to the church. So they crushed it. And, and for 500 years, these mushroom cults went underground until the 50s. So to certain kinds of authority, that direct access is, like, is hugely threatening. And, you know... And I mean, it, is it fundamentally destabilizing? Like you, ha- you said, all these researchers, you feel underneath, yeah. un- underneath their scientific facade, like a, yearn- a yearning. So part, of me, something- part of me feels that there's something fundamental to the drugs that will be challenging. I mean, that um, they do cause many people... See, and, and I, my reluctance is I hate to generalize about them because the effects can be so variable and so dependent on context. So it's easy to imagine a context where they're not destabilizing. But anyway, in the 60s, I'll give you an example of why they were so destabilizing then, but why that won't happen again. Okay. Okay? And this is, but we're in the realm of speculation, right? Except, yes. well, history and then speculation. So in the 60s, I think what was really destabilizing about LSD and psilocybin is that it was giving uh, the youth culture an experience that adult culture didn't have. So you had this, it was a rite of passage for people. I mean, it was this, it was like a conversion experience. People who, you know, you were experienced or you weren't experienced, as Jimi Hendrix famously said. And, um, uh, And, but most rites of passage in all cultures are designed by the elders to conduct the the adolescence into the adult world, whether you're talking about a bar mitzvah or a vision quest, whatever it is. The rules are set by the adults, the kids do it, and when they complete the assignment, Mm -hmm. they are adults. Here you had the kids were organizing their own rite of passage, and they ended up in a place that adults were completely unfamiliar with. That can only happen once, because now the, the adults have had experience. Um, you know, in large numbers. People, many people in charge in our society have had a psychedelic experience. So the, I don't think they'll ever be quite as threatened as, say, my parents were in the 60s and Richard Nixon was in the 60s. If you had to guess, would you... Well, would you guess that it... If, if I asked you now to guess whether or not it will get shut down again, yeah. what, would, what would you say? I would say No. You would say no. Yeah, I, I think uh, Rick Doblin, who is uh, one of the key movers and shakers in this research, um, uh, he has an organization called the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, known as MAPS. Um, he makes the point that, um, and, he, and, and this he credits to Leary, that Leary turned on so many people with his antics and his, you know, turn on, tune in, drop out, that we now have a culture that can accept psychedelics. In other words, he, he infected enough people that you're not going to have uh, the same kind of reaction. And he also points out that so many other social or cultural or aesthetic innovations of the 60s we take for granted. You know, in the 60s, there was not yoga. There was not uh, natural childbirth. There was not um, uh, hospice care. I mean, all these innovations, um, you know, we've gotten used to. And he, and he thinks now we can get used to this. So, lo- so, so Whether so, he's right or not, I don't know. But, but uh-huh. it's an interesting case. But, but your guess is we can get used to it. And, 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 and it will go people, down differently Unless people today really fuck up. Then it went down before. It doesn't have to go down the same way because you don't have the situation where you have, you know, a generation gap, that you have the split. I and mean, we've never had such a... Uh, in American history, uh, a situation where the young had a different culture than the old. We don't have it now. You know, we can listen to our kids' music. They can listen to our music. No, you can't. We <laughs> all wear blue jeans. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, there, there's, there's just more continuity right. now. I mean, it was really a sharp, sharp break, and LSD had something to do with that break. Okay. And so, yeah, so I'm, I'm guardedly optimistic. You're guardedly optimistic. Which brings us to the Renaissance and what it wants to accomplish. Um, why don't you start by... Um, well, let me just ask. So do you think, like... So, we, so, so all of these drugs did get a really bad name in the 60s and they were seen as dangerous. And I got the sense that you really feel like that was, that, that, um, was wholly unwarranted. Do you feel like uh, that is wholly unwarranted? Yeah. No, I mean, I think it's important to talk about risk. 
because um, things go wrong, you know? And, and there were a lot of horror stories in the 60s. Many of them were urban legends, you know, the one about people, kids staring at the sun till they go blind. I remember hearing that one when I was in high school. That was completely made up. The commissioner of the blind for the state of Washington wanted to discourage kids from using LSD, so he said, oh, this story will do it. And, and it worked. And it worked. Boom. It's, and it's, I still run into people who believe it. Uh -huh. And they're all these urban legends. But an Art Linkletter's daughter jumped out of a window and he blamed LSD and campaigned against it, which helped drive the drug war. Um, was that true? Was that really about LSD? We don't know. I mean, there's no evidence of it. That's what he believed. Um, but... Here's the, but it's important to understand that there are risks associated with these drugs. They, you know, you are destabilized. Uh, your defenses are down. You're incapacitated, you know, on a high dose. And people do stupid things under those circumstances. They walk out into traffic. They fall out of buildings. They, um, you know, that's going to happen. There, there are risks. Other people have um, uh, terrifying experiences, um, some, of, some of which go into the rubric bad trip but a handful of them go under the rubric of psychotic episodes. Um, people at risk for mental illness, schizophrenia, say, I mean, if they have a predisposition or family, you know, family history of it, they need to stay away from these drugs. And they're not allowed in these trials, which are very carefully, um, they carefully select people. Um, we don't know that psychedelics have ever caused a serious mental illness in people or, or were, you know, at someone who wasn't at risk for it, but... Um, it's possible. Um, so the risks are psychological. They're n oddly enough, they're not physiological. Um, I was, mm. you know, I was a nervous Nelly about this and, and really mm -hmm. checked, it, checked things out carefully before I did this. Um, but they're remarkably non-toxic. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a lethal dose of Advil. I don't know what it is, or Tylenol. I mean, lots of over-the-counter drugs have lethal doses, and there is no known lethal dose for the classic psychedelics. Um, and they're, they're uh, non-addictive. Um, they're not habit-forming. The, your, your first thought when you have completed a psychedelic journey is like, where do I get some more? It's like, do I ever have to do that again? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's, let's turn to the Renaissance and um, briefly how it got started and then and what are they trying to accomplish and how they are trying to accomplish it? Well, there's not one they. There's a couple different they's. But, but basically, the, the, the research stops, grinds to a halt, finally in the early 70s. Um, and, um, but it slows down a lot in the late 60s. And, and funding dries up. And some, some researchers were told to stop. Uh, got telegrams from the FDA, apparently, saying, no more. Um, others, uh, it kind of petered out. And, and scientists didn't stand up for it that hard, which is an interesting story, too. Um, there was this snicker factor that, you know, if you, that it, that it was such a stigma that you didn't, you didn't, you didn't want to be associated mm -hmm. with it, even though you had thought it was very promising. Um, but there were people who always felt that this was a loss to mental health care and psychiatry. And several people beginning in the 90s start meeting and organizing and some of them are scientists but a lot of them are amateurs like Rick Doblin, mm -hmm. um, uh, another man I, I talk about in the book, Bob Jesse, who was an engineer at Oracle who had a psychedelic experience and like an unusual number of engineers in Silicon Valley um, decided that this was really important to the spiritual development of the individual and the society and, and he and he helped organize research. And in many cases, these guys, who were not scientists themselves, recruited scientists to, to study it. They would raise the money and find the scientists. And so a couple different research groups got started uh, beginning in the 90s. And the first papers, uh, important papers, were really published in the early 2000s. Their thinking is, first, to, re to reproduce the kind of shoddy research that was done because I shouldn't call it shoddy. The standards changed a lot in the early 60s. In the early 60s, we have um, a, a crisis with a drug called thalidomide, uh, which we were, it was a, uh, was it a sedative? It was given to women with morning sickness. And, and there was a lot of deformed And there was a lot of deformed babies. And it was a yeah. tremendous scandal. And 
And so in the wake of that, we really tightened up drug regulation, and that's really when you move to the placebo-controlled double-blind study. And um, uh, so the standard of research before that was not as good as after that. And so these researchers smartly felt, we've got to redo some of those studies. Let's see if it really works with alcoholics, Let's, as it was commonly used for. Let's see if it'll work with people who are dying and help them with their death. And so a lot of the work going on is a, is a kind of reprise. In of, the 90s and even today. And, and into the 2000s and, and to today. And it's, 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 it's essentially proving that these drugs can be effective for, for the treatment end of, of life, right. depression, Anxiety. Anxiety. Uh, and in the case of MDMA, ecstasy, which is not a classic psychedelic, uh, PTSD, um, and uh, obsession. There's been some studies of, uh, or a study of obsessive compulsive disorder, um, and different kinds of addiction. So uh, a lot of people, if this works, stand to benefit. I mean, there are 300 million uh, cases of depression, major depression in the world. Um, we know that those rates are up. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that rates of suicide are up. Rates of addiction are up. And that the, the toolkit in mental health care is not very well stocked. Um, we have, you know, the, the last big innovation were the antidepressants, you know, which come in in the late 80s. Uh, and now we're finding, you know, that they don't work all that well and people don't like taking them. So what is, what, is the, what, what is the treatment that they are testing and what kind of success are people seeing? And what kinds of success rates are they seeing? So, you know, I, I, I mean, I can pick different examples, but I, I think the, uh, one like of them... Like for depression? Well, the, 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 the treatment of people with cancer is really a treatment for depression and anxiety in those people. They call it existential distress, but that's not an official diagnosis. Um, and there was a phase two trial of uh, about 80 people at, done at NYU and Johns Hopkins. And um, these trials were people who had a cancer diagnosis, many of them were terminal, but not all of them, who were really paralyzed by fear, anxious, and depressed. Um, I talked to a lot of these patients, and they had astonishing experiences. I'm just give you one example, because we haven't really um, you know, given the patient's point of view on this, mm -hmm. but I talked to this woman. Um, she was in her early 60s. She was a New Yorker. Uh, she was a figure skating instructor and she had ovarian cancer. And it had been, she had a successful course of treatment, but she was paralyzed by fear it was gonna come back. Uh, she just couldn't function. Um, and she uh, entered the program at NYU and had, a, a, an, a, an important thing to understand is you have one or maybe two experiences. This is not a drug you take every day. This is, this, th you're really treating a mental problem with an experience, not a chemical, finally. Which, which is challenging to some to of our things in and of itself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A, 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 like, it challenges maybe the way that we should think and about where it's depression It's a very comes different from. paradigm, yes. Right. Or addiction, for that matter. Right. Because they, we have all of these kind of chemical um, explanations, which this these seems actually, like this, this might is challenge. Not, but this is not a chemical fix for anything. It, right. It, this I is mean, kind of a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a psychological. It's a reimagining. It's, right. it's, yeah, it's a psychological fix. So, so this woman um, has this experience, and at one point in it, she goes into her body, and, she's, she, and, and this happens to a lot of the cancer patients. They go into their body, and they see their cancer. In her case, she saw this black mass located under her rib cage, and she realized that was her fear. It wasn't her cancer, because it wasn't in the right place. It was her fear. And she screamed at it. She said, get the fuck out of my body. And it went away. The black mass went away. And after, she, after the trip was over, her fear, you know, wasn't, she didn't have the fear anymore. And I wrote in the New Yorker article, you know, using the usual journalistic Weasley words, her fear was substantially diminished, thinking that would be easier to get past the fact checkers. But when the fact checkers called her, she said, no, that's all wrong. It wasn't diminished, it was eliminated. Absolutely eliminated. So she had attained a perspective. And, and, and the way she put it to me was, I realized I can't control my cancer, but I can control my fear. And, and that distinction, which is a really important distinction, allowed her to live again. And, but what are the, and what are the, and you must have talked to a lot of people like that, what are the actual rates for, let's say, depression? So in these two studies, if you crunch them, well, the, the Hopkins study, let me see if I remember this right, 
in 80% of the cases, um, people had statistically significant reductions in um, uh, standard measures of depression and anxiety. Um, the effect size, which is a, is a statistical measure to, to measure the, the strength of the effect, um, was um, unprecedented. Now, this is a small sample, um, and we have to realize this isn't, this isn't what you go to market with. Um, but it was, uh, you know, we don't have psychiatric... Um, I, I think the SSRIs were approved with a 0.3 mm -hmm. uh, effect size, and this, these were 1.0 or higher. Um, so very strong effect size. And if that, if that survives in the next round of, um, of research, of trials, that'll be starting hopefully later this year, that'll be a really big deal. And so huh. the it's, fact a, it's interesting because, you know, you said that the original, you know, after the bicycle ride that changed the, it, it gave us a kind of more chemical view. And now it seems it's like not, it's this a psychological like, view. Now we have a chemical view and this and now it's serving the other purpose, which is kind yeah. of potentially. Well, I mean, is it is that is that the yeah, no, I think that that's right. I mean, I think we're going to learn. I mean, we are learning interesting things at the level of the brain, what the chemistry is doing in the brain. Uh -huh. But it appears to be a psychological shift in people, a, a, almost a quantum shift in the way they look at certain things. And that's, that's kind of weird. I mean, some of the smokers, I, I was very mystified. There was a study of smoking, a small uh, pilot study of smoking at Hopkins, 15 smokers given a couple psilocybin trips supported by some cognitive behavioral therapy. Smoking is a very hard addiction to break. And, um, and these people would, you know, uh, stop smoking after their psilocybin trip. And I was like, how did you do that? What, ha what changed? Um, and and they would, this one woman said to me, she was uh, also about 60 and she was a book editor, uh, Irish woman, and she said, um, well, I, I, I sprouted wings and I went all through <laughs> Western history and I saw, you know, Shakespeare and I, and I saw him, and I died three times and I saw my body on a pyre on the Ganges and I realized that the universe was so amazing and there were so many amazing things to do that killing yourself by smoking seemed really stupid. <laughs> This is her epiphany, but the thing to understand is that epiphanies in the psychedelic experience have a weight and authority that they don't have in normal life. Because they're not purely intellectual experiences. They're, they're a different kind of experience, which brings us to oh, your trip. My experience. Um, uh, so, let's talk about your trip. Um, so, okay. So you have talked to lots and lots of people who have had, you must have be really interested to have this experience. So why don't you... I was interested and I was terrified too. Okay. I mean, these were, you know, these weren't fun. Nobody talked about a fun experience. There were moments of bliss and ecstasy, but there were also moments of unspeakable horror. And so I didn't enter into this lightly. I was a very reluctant psychonaut. And... Um, Every night, before, I did about six trips for the book mm -hmm. um, on different substances. I did four different substances. And um, every night, I had this ping pong match going on in my head. A part of my mind is saying, are you crazy? You know, because I'm working underground. I can't go enter mm -hmm. the Hopkins. They didn't want me, and NYU wouldn't have me. Because I didn't fit what they were looking for, and um, maybe other reasons, I don't know. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I went underground, and there is a, I, I end up exploring this underground community of guides um, who are very serious professional therapists working underground. And um, not that there probably aren't a lot of charlatans, too, but the ones I met were remarkably uh, ethical and, and um, uh, trustworthy. Well, not all of them, but most of them were. <laughs> um, there were some people that I just thought were a little too wanky for me. Yeah. But I'm sure they're fine for other people. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and so part of my mind is like, you're going to go uh, to the top of this mountain in this guy's yurt, and what if you have a heart attack? Is he going to call 911? He's going to be worried about getting arrested. You could die up there. And I was playing out these fantasies, and the other side of me was like, you've got a book to write. You know, you really... <laughs> And aren't you curious? And don't you want to see if you learn something about your consciousness? I mean, and it went back and forth. And I realized that voice of, of alarm was my ego trying to prevent me from doing something that was going to be an enormous challenge to my ego. Um, and 
and I really got in touch with that. So, but I did find I could surrender to the experience once I had passed that point of no return. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that you talk about, and I want to, well, I, so, so what were your, let, let's, let's do it this way. What were, what were the most significant experiences that you had during your trips, and what do you feel like you learned from them, and do you feel like you have changed, or have, like, in some substantive way? Well, that's a big question. I know, that was several questions. Yeah. I well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about one trip, okay, um, uh, that I think was really significant for me. So it was a fairly high-dose psilocybin trip. I was trying to kind of simulate the doses that they were using at Hopkins and NYU, and, um, with, but not with pills. They used pills, to, a, a synthetic derivative. I was using mushrooms with a guide who uh, was a very um, empathetic woman who was about my age, and I just I had a good feeling about her, a good trust, and, um, and she was incredibly scrupulous. She, she made me fill out a 15-page questionnaire about my life and then, mm -hmm. you know, all the meds I was on and took them to a doctor to check it out. I mean, it was, as one of the guides said, you know, we don't have very good insurance, so we're very careful. <laughs> um, and... Um, and on this experience, I mean, a lot of things happened, uh, and, and some of it was really unpleasant. The music that was being played, I, I had a problem with the music. It was very kind of new age, you know, the kind of music you'd hear getting a, a, a massage at a fancy, you know, spa, and it wasn't right. And, but it sounded like electronica, and it conjured for me this space that looked, I was inside a video game. It was very dystopian. And I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be outside or something. And, and so I'm going through this video game. And it's like, ugh. And, um, uh, and I asked to change the music. I have a little argument with the, the guide. And, and the music changes, but I'm still stuck in this place. And at some point, I took off my, um, uh, my eye shades. Remember, you're wearing eye shades. And, um, and, and the world came back. And it was, you know, I, was just, I wanted to make sure the world was still existing. And, and there were these, you know, ah, a window, a door, a wall, you know, thank God, you know, the real world. And um, I also had to take a pee, and, um, uh, and after that was over, uh, I came back, and, and my guide, who I call Mary in the book, said, uh, do you want a booster? And I said, yes, and she gave me more, and I turned and looked at her. She was, she was kind of crouching down next to me on this mattress. And, I, and she's normally, she's blonde, she's got hair parted in the middle, fairly high cheekbones. And I looked at her and she had turned into Maria Sabina, who's this Mexican healer who gave Gordon Wasson, the first Westerner to ever have psilocybin, his psilocybin in Huatla de Jimenez, Oaxaca. And she had turned into this person and she had this leathery skin over her and black hair and she was wearing a white peasant dress and her hands were just like pure hide. And she's handing me this mushroom and was like, Oh, this is really Damn. freaky. And, and I didn't think I should tell her what had happened to her. And, um, um, and on the additional dose, um, something really weird happened. I mean, something weird had already happened, but um, <laughs> I felt myself kind of explode into a little cloud of pieces of paper, like little post-its. And that was, <laughs> that was me. And, but I was fine with it. And I know that sounds paradoxical. Who's this other I? And I'm not sure exactly. But I, I had no desire to pile the slips back together and you know, make, put myself back together. It was like Humpty Dumpty, but it was fine. And then I looked out, and I saw myself now spread over the landscape like a coat of paint. I was out there. But what was this I? But the I that was perceiving it wasn't my ego, wasn't myself. It had no interests. It was completely disinterested. It was calm. It was unburdened. And I realized that perspective that could accept anything, including the death of yourself, your, you know, the extinction of your ego, that was probably something like the perception that those, the people who had cancer had in their trials, that they had attained a kind of perspective, or kind, it felt like a kind of consciousness, where anything that could befall us was okay. Um, and that that consciousness was not restricted to, to my body. It was like bigger than that. You know, I'm not saying it was supernatural or anything, but, mm -hmm. but the takeaway from me, you asked what, how did this affect me, was that I'm not identical to my ego. I think most of us assume 
our ego and us are like we're like this and that there is another ground on which to stand where you can behold experience in life without the kind of that kind of small-minded egotistical defensiveness or is this am I up or am I down am I you know uh, am I liked is this person um, you know I mean th that objectifies other people all the things are ego I mean egos are great egos get books mm -hmm. written mm -hmm. um, um, God I don't want to I don't want to demean the ego entirely but but they also punish us they tell they tell destructive stories you know they they stick they get us stuck in these loops um, that we can't get out of. I think they mire us in habits. Um, and so I got, a, I got some distance on my ego that I hadn't had before. And that was, uh, th that's a good thing. Now I can tell when my ego's up to his old tricks. I can like quiet that voice, that neurotic chatter. You can uh, quiet, you can actually quiet in it. More in a, easily, in, yeah. Because I say, oh, that's, that's him. He's doing that thing again. Huh. Now that's the kind of insight you get from psychotherapy, right? Um, you know, you can. Mm -hmm. But I got it in an afternoon, right? It, you know, and, and that was... Cheaper. Is, <laughs> it was a lot cheaper. Um, so I, I thought that was a big takeaway. And in terms of how that changed me, you know, I, I think I'm a somewhat more open person. I think I'm a somewhat less defensive person. Um, I, people started asking me this question. So of course I asked my wife, Judith, because... Your partner knows if you're changing, right? I mean, usually. And, um, and she said something interesting, and this goes back to where we started, um, which was that, well, I really think, my dad died in January, that, that um, I really think uh, you dealt with that differently than you would have. And that I was, in her view, I was much more kind of emotionally available to him and to my sisters and my mother uh, through this whole process. And I, and, I, and I sat with him for 10 days. And, and she said, you probably would have found excuses not to do that at another time. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of the big things our, our egos defend us against is death, mm -hmm. thinking about death, seeing death. And I dealt with it. And, um, and that was a blessing to my father and it was a blessing to me. Well, thank you. I think we have, I'm getting like evil eyes, 10 minutes. Okay, um, and so you want me to do, all right. Um, a little late getting the questions, I think. I know. I'm sorry. Um, so, okay. So, let's go to your... I'm sorry. My answers are very long. <laughs> your answers are very awesome. All right. So, how does this book topic... Let me, give me a second. Um, oh. How does this book topic relate to most of your previous works, which were food-related? Yeah. Well, I think it relates, as I said earlier, in that I'm very interested in this engagement with nature, and, and, and this is part of our engagement with the natural world. And um, uh, so I see it as, as part of our natural history. And remember, you know, the 60s has influenced how we see psychedelics, but they've been used in other societies for thousands of years. They're part of the human story. And uh, it's not just a, you know, creation of Timothy Leary and Ken Kesey. And... Um, and, 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 that, and, and there are things we take into our bodies. Um, it's about consumption. Uh, and, and, and here's the, the, the other connection that I should have said first. I'm interested in health and healing. And, and a lot of my work on food is like, how, are, you know, how is it that, we, that our diet, you know, given all our wealth and, and, what, and, and the amazing foods available to us, that we've constructed a diet that is killing us and that reliably, you know, shortens people's lives. And... and um, uh, chronic disease is really the big health problem we face uh, on the on the body side, and and then I became very interested in mental health and um, and how might we deal with that? Because I really don't think we deal with it very well. If you compare mental health care in this country, in this world, with any other branch of medicine, infectious disease or oncology or cardiology, it hasn't it hasn't done very much. Mm -hmm. um, so we need some new thinking, and and this might be it. I don't want to oversell it. I mean, there's a lot of research that still needs to be done, but it's one of the more hopeful things on the horizon. Okay, this is a question which is kind of related to one of my questions. What if you're curious and believe wholeheartedly, but also feel like your brain is so fragile hmm. that you don't want to mess with it and come back crazy as if I'm not already? That's the actual question. <laughs> so, um... So, which is, yeah, so what do you want to say to these people? I mean, I'm, I, I, I find myself curious about, like, 
who is going to walk away from this um, evening and be like, and I'm signing myself up? Um, does does any like like do you, do people? Well, I guess I shouldn't ask. Cause Wait, were you on a show of hands? I, I was gonna ask for a show of hands, and I'm like, is that allowed? All right, but I I mean, like, what do you want to say to these people about whether or not? Um, they should try this and whether or not, you know, whether, yeah. What do you want to say well, I, to these yeah. people? Yeah, so I would never, I, I would I, never would, tell someone to try this. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very personal decision and it's not right for everybody. And, um, and, you know, it's something that you have to consider, you know, long and hard. It's, it's a fateful step. I mean, they're, they're you know, powerful drugs and, and, People do have bad experiences. If you do decide to do it, I would seriously think about having a guide. Um, I mean, first I would try to join the trials that are going to happen this year. I mean, that's the best way to approach it. If you fit, if you suffer from major depression or treatment-resistant depression or PTSD, whatever is going to be tried, you know, is studied, call Hopkins, call NYU. Uh, and, uh, and there'll be a bunch of other sites where these will be happening um, and get involved there. But if you want to do it and you can't do that, then um, a guided experience... The experience I had of, that, of, of letting go of my ego, I couldn't have done that on my own. I would not have felt safe enough to do that on my own. It was the space that Mary created that allowed me to do that. So, you know, that, so you can't just... It's not about getting a pill. It's really about... Uh, getting an experience, and that experience involves, I think, finding a guide. And I, there, and I can't obviously refer anyone to guides. There's a lot of resources I've just posted on my website that could introduce you to communities where you might, you know, find the kind of people who could then introduce you to guides. Um, <laughs> so if you're clever, you can, uh, you know. Um. I like this. I'm just going to quickly read this question because I like it. My brother has been doing psychedelic journeys for a decade. Why, is his e why does his ego still take up the whole room? <laughs> um, <laughs> which I'm guessing that you don't have. That is such a good question. I thought that's why I read it. So, so this oh my is, God, you actually have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. So this is a paradox. <laughs> this is genuinely a paradox. This, this profound ego-dissolving experience has produced some of the greatest egotists. Um, and I think it's something... I mean, Timothy Leary is an example. Um, uh, it's something about feeling you have found the key to the universe. Right. <laughs> you know, that you found something so profound that you own this truth uh -huh. that, and then that then makes you special. Um, so I think it's, I think it's, a, it's a paradox. Um, okay. Um, oh, that doesn't, okay. Let me just see. Oh, no, you're not. Okay. Um, Don't you want to hear the one she's not reading? <laughs> <laughs> is there, um, is there such a thing as too much ego dissolution? Hmm. Well, you know, I, I've heard people say, um, that you have to have a strong ego to let go of it and then snap back. And... Um, and so I, I can imagine some people who have personality disorders or, or, or perhaps are young and, and not fully formed. I don't understand why, you know, teenagers would want to mess around with ego dissolution um, because they're still building their egos. And, um, and one of, I, I say, and it's sort of a throwaway line in the book that, you know, maybe psychedelics are wasted on the young. Um, mm -hmm. And... Um, that they, are, they have more value to us once we're fully formed and, 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 and gotten a little ossified, you know, and mm -hmm. that, that, they, that they, they lubricate cognition in a way that the old need more than the young. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, there's an interview in the book, as you know, with um, Alison Gopnik, a child mm -hmm. psychologist, and she's, she's convinced that young children under five or four are tripping most of the time. That, <laughs> that that's how their brains work. <laughs> And, and, and she makes a very good case. It's not, it's not a, a casual comment. Um, and, that it, and that she thinks psychedelics are interesting because it's a way to understand uh, child consciousness. And, and I totally get it. Let, you know, they don't have the priors. Mm -hmm. They don't have those models of reality. They're actually having to look at that tree and see it in all its treeness mm -hmm. in a way we, we no longer mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. 
All right. Um, has learning? Here's another question. Has learning about psychedelics changed or impacted the way that you think about food? Just to yeah, bring the two together. Yeah, you know, it's the last thing you think about during a psychedelic journey is food. <laughs> um, they'd be good diet pills if you could take them every day. <laughs> um, I have to think about that. It's the second time I've been asked that question, and I, I and I, I don't. I don't have uh, an idea. The mushrooms you would never like cook with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they they taste pretty uh, gnarly. Uh huh. Yeah. So, I, I wish I had a, a very beautiful, neat thing to say about that, but I don't. Okay. Um, do you have any tips for people interested in exploring these sorts of human-plant interactions, but who are, as you say, allergic to woo-woo, or is there no other way but to hold your nose and dive in? <laughs> so, you know, the community of underground gods did tend to be more on the New Age side of mm -hmm. things, and, and that kind of vocabulary. They're also energy healers and constellation therapists, and, and that whole range of, um, you know, human potential movement modalities, which I, I don't normally have a lot of patience for. Mm -hmm. um, but I found that I could, I kind of, Got, I, I, maybe I heard it enough, I got comfortable with it. And, and finally, the vocabulary someone uses is not as powerful as their personality, which comes across. I mean, we know this about therapists. Whatever their system is, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter. I, I found myself wondering about the power of these people in, in, in reading your book, because it does seem like um, they can take you to they can take you to places that you would not have gone. And how would you regulate where they take you? I mean, like that seems well, like if you're very, going to if you're going to scale up, like except they're very, there's a great humility to the way guiding is done. It's not directive. They learned over time that it's best not to program the experience or intervene in any way. They say very very little. They really. They, they strongly believe that, like the body, the mind can heal itself, and it will do what it needs to do, and that you, as a therapist, their real role is in the preparation and the integration. They're really kind of babysitting during the, the actual trip. I mean, that's oversimplifying it. But So the, the, the fact that, yes, maybe they could brainwash you, you know? Uh -huh. I mean, Charles Manson comes to mind. Um, uh, they, you know, you have to trust them because... You know, I, I don't know. Maybe they could fool around, but you know, with your mind. But um, but I found that that there's a there, there's an ethic of humility, um, and that it's your mind and this medicine, and together you're going to go where you need to go, and and I'm not going to interfere with that. Okay. Well, I am. The evil eyes are telling me that I am out of time, and you are out of time. But thank you so so much. Oh, uh, at least this. thank you. So thank you very great. much. Really, really appreciate it. Really appreciate all of your work. Um, and you. I guess what, oh, and my, we're, he, there's going to be a reading, I mean, a signing. Thank you. Thank you so much to Elise and Michael. If you're staying for the signing, please stay seated. And for those who are not staying for the signing, you can exit through this main lobby and then this corner lobby to my right.